So welcome to Person, Place, and Thing, um, where we discuss a person, a place, and a thing for this week in history. Um, we'll talk about uh, the first story will be a person. We'll spill the tea on what happened to a specific person. And then we'll talk about a place where something significant happened. And then we'll talk about a thing that was discovered, invented, found, um, all those kinds of things. And then after each story, we'll go over some fun facts and tidbits. Um, and we'll hear from our guest, who is Papa Bear Sings, um, to see if they have more information, insights, ideas, feelings, thoughts on what we just talked about. And he'll come in after every um, story. And then um, I've got a quote of the week as well um, that we will discuss later on in the show. And stay to the complete end of the show because we will be doing honorable mentions um, for each day of the week uh, this past week. So a um, little disclaimer, uh, we are trying to get featured, so we have to follow featured rules. Uh, no smoking, no drinking, no nudity, and no cussing. Please be respectful to yourself, everybody in the chat, my guest, and me too please. And then um, I try to keep all of my topics light and fun. Um, but we have to remember that history is what it is. And nothing that I no topics that I choose to discuss, reflect any kind of um, opinion, or belief of my own. It just is what it is. It's history. So let's get right into it. Our person today is going to be Elizabeth Blackwell. She was the first female physician in the United States. And then our place is going to be uh, Greenboro, North Carolina. And then our thing is going to be the groundhog because Groundhog's Day did just pass on the second. It's seen its shadow, so six more weeks of winter, y'all. All right, let's get right into it. So like I said before, our person is Elizabeth Blackwell. Um, she was born February 3rd of 1821 to Samuel Blackwell and Hannah Blackwell. Um, Samuel worked as a, a sugar refiner. They had their own sugar refinery. Um, and and they, lived, they lived a decent life, not super wealthy, not super materialistic. Um, her parents kind of reminded me of those, those hippie parents that um, they kind of go against everything that's um, believed. Um, so like her parents believe that women and children should have um, access to education. They should be able to be educated. Um, and that wasn't a popular belief back then. Back then women were supposed to be teachers or in the home taking, taking care of the kids. And that's where a woman's place was back in 1821. In um, 1832, uh, the family migrated to the United States because uh, their most profitable sugar refinery burnt down. And um, uh, they, her parents hired tutors to give her an education because she couldn't go to school. So her parents hi hired tutors and then they taught her as well to try to supplement her education because she wasn't allowed to go and get one. Um, and, and because of that, she was really like isolated socially. So she kind of kept to herself. She didn't really go socialize with a bunch of people because she was focused on her study. Um, at the age of 17, Elizabeth's father passed away and that left the family with little to no money. And um, her little brothers were not um, old enough to work. They weren't of working age yet. She had two older sisters and six younger siblings. So there was nine altogether. Um, and so after their dad died, um, her and her sisters opened a school um, it's called the Cincinnati English and French Academy for Young Ladies um, to try to bring in money since their dad had died um, and, until, their, uh, until their siblings came of working age. Um, and it did well for a time, but then Elizabeth, 
she decided to try to branch out to see what kind of religion resonated with her, what she really believed in. Um, and back then, education and re religion were very much tied together. There wasn't separation there. So when she started branching out to see what really fit with her, it, her school took a hit because of that, and they ended up shutting down. Um, and it's during that time that Elizabeth really started dedicating time to self-improvement um, and education. Um, this is really when she began to articulate thoughts about women's rights and um, how women should have equal rights to men. And she wrote all of that in her journal. And she actually participated in the Harrison political campaign in 1840. And then in 1844, Elizabeth got a job making $1,000 a month, or sorry, $1,000 a year um, teaching school. And she didn't mind teaching. Um, she didn't really like the school set up. It was kind of dingy, kind of run down. But what really bothered her was back then, slavery was still very much a thing that bothered her. Um, she actually wrote in her journal, kind as the people were to me personally, the sense of justice was continually outraged. And at the end of the first term of engagement, I resigned this, the situation. So she couldn't stay there when there was active slavery um, and injustice in that way. So she, she went to North Carolina and she began um, teaching there with a goal of making $3,000 for her medical education. Um, during her time in North Carolina, she lodged with a reverend, um, a clergyman, but um, he was a physician before he was a clergyman. And he completely supported her dreams and her aspirations, and he allowed her to use his medical books to study. Um, and then um, she really wanted to get into the Philadelphia Medical School. Um, that was really where she was going. Um, so in 1847, she left Charleston and went to Philadelphia in New York um, with the aim of invest, investing in opportunities in medical study. Um, and she, she was met with like a lot of resistance. There was nobody really wanted to let her in the door to do the schooling. And their primary reason was number one, because she was a woman. Ultimately, it comes down to because she was a woman. And number two, she might have actually proven equal to the task. Um, so she could have been their competition. And um, quote, unquote, what they said to her is that she could not expect them to furnish her with a stick to beat our heads with. And so out of desperation, she applied to 12 different medical schools to try to get into um, country schools. And in October 1847, Blackwell was accepted as a medical student in the Geneva Medical College located in Geneva, New York. Um, the dean that is and faculty that's normally was um, decided who matriculated into college and who didn't, they didn't know what to do because it was such a, a odd request. They hadn't got a request for a female to start medical study. And so what they did is as a joke, as a joke, they left it up to the student body to vote on whether she would be able to attend or not. And even if even one kid, one man decided that they didn't want her there, she couldn't go. But all 150 men voted to allow her to go to this college. And so she did. And um, the, it was, it took time to get used to. She didn't really know where everything was. She had a hard time finding her books, um, but she was accepted at the school. Um, they didn't, they didn't really treat her bad, but the townspeople kind, kind of treated her like an oddity. So like, look, that's the one that's going to medical school. That's the woman over there. Shh, she's going to medical school. Because she's a woman. Um, but during that time, she stayed with uh, Dr. Elder and applied for different medical positions for her internship. Um, and she was, again, met with resistance. 
but she did end up um, going to the Blockley Elms house. Um, and again, just a lot of resistance, a lot of hardship because she was a woman, because she was female trying to be a physician. She, she got a lot of backlash for it. Um, but she did slowly gain um, acceptance. Uh, some of the younger residents still refused to work with her um, to like help her out and check everything and uh, to make sure that she was doing well. And during her studies, she was appalled by the syphilic ward and those affected by typhus. Um, her graduating medical call, uh, her thesis um, was on typhus and it actually foreshadows um, her later reform work. In April of 1849, Blackwell went to Europe to continue her education and ended up in Paris. And um, on November 4th of 1849, uh, she was treating an infant with a contagious disease and she accidentally squirted some contaminated fluid into her eye and her eye ended up getting infected and she had to have surgery and she lost all vision in that eye. So that dampered her, her aspirations to be a surgeon because that's ultimately what she really wanted to do was be a surgeon and that made it so that she could not do that. Um, but she did, um, she did get her, uh, her medical degree in America. So she was the first female physician in America, like ever in America. And after she recovered um, from her eye, she um, returned to London in 1850, but felt that the prejudice for women in the medical field was, was less in America. And so she returned to New York in 1851 and she attempted to make her own practice but it didn't do well. And so it ended up floundering mostly because people said, were saying that any female physicians were there to help with abortion. Um, they were there to help with abortion patients and help them get back on their feet, which was completely false. Um, and then she established a dispensary near Tomskin Square. Um, and she also took Marie, <laughs> this is the name, Zakrawiska. She was Polish and she was pursuing her medical uh, degree too. And so Elizabeth took her under her wing and helped train her and helped her get her foot in um, so that she could, she could also be a female physician. And then they expanded the dispensary into the U New York Infirmary for Indigenous Women and Children. And then Elizabeth served on the board of trustees for that. And then um, the patient load doubled in the second year. So she went from like fighting and scratching and biting and clawing her way into the medical field to her patients doubling in a year. So she was doing really, really well. Um, and then when the American war broke out, she, she put her efforts into, into teaching um, nurses, female nurses, how to, how to care for uh, the wounded soldiers. And so she put a lot of effort into that. She also served on different communities against um, slavery, against um, sexism. Um, and then on bringing education to women and children in the United States. Um, she made several trips back to Britain to raise um, funds and try to establish a parallel uh, infirmary there. And in 1858, under the clause of the Medical Act of 1858, that recognized doctors with foreign degrees practicing in Britain before 1858. She was also be able to become the first woman to have her name entered on the General Medical Council council's medical register on the 1st of January in 1859. In 1874, Blackwell established a medical school in London with Sophia Blake, who, who was also a student with her in um, New York years after she had left. Um, and after the school was established, Blackwell lost a lot of her authority to Blake and was elected as a lecturer in midwifery. 
She resigned the position in 1877 and that officially ended her medical career. Um, and then the school opened as the one that her and uh, Blake, Sophie Blake, were trying to open. It opened as the School of Medicine for Women with the primary goal of preparing women for licensing exam of the Apothecaries Hall. She co-founded the National Health Society in 1871 and perceived herself as a, a gentlewoman who had the leisure to dabble in reform and intellectual activities. The income from her American investments um, supported her and it was during this time that her greatest uh, reform activity was um, present in the medical profession and that was from 1880 to 1895. Um, she was interested in a great number of reform movements, um, sexual purity, hygiene, medical education, but also preventative medita medication, um, sanitation, and family planning, uh, women's rights, Christian socialism, medical ethics, and anti-vivection. That's where they uh, practice on living creatures. So like animals and stuff, she was very against that. In the 1880s, Blackwell was well connected both in the United States and the United Kingdoms and exchanged letters with Lady Byron about women's rights issues and became very close friends with Florence Nightingale, with whom she discussed opening and running hospitals together. She remained lifelong friends with Barbara and um, Emily Stanton in 1883 and was close to her family. And she visited her parents and not her parents, but her siblings anytime she could. Um, so she was a very, she really was a family person. Um, she was never really, uh, she never got married. She never really dated. She didn't have a, like she was focused on her goals and that is what she was trying to accomplish. Um, so she never got married. She did adopt a kid um, in 1856 when she was establishing her New York um, infirmary. She adopted Catherine Kitty Berry in 1848. Um, she was an Irish orphan from the House of Reg Refuge on Randall's Island. Um, her diary showed that she adopted Kitty out of loneliness and because she needed somebody to help take care of her in her later years. Um, and Barry stayed with her for all of Blackwell's life. Um, after Blackwell died, Barry stayed in the Rock House and then moved to Killiam in Scotland where Blackwell was buried, buried in the church uh, yard of St. Munn's Parish Church. In 1820, she moved in with the Blackwells and took on the Blackwell last name. So, so she did, after um, Elizabeth died, get to actually be a Blackwell. And on her deathbed in 1936, um, Kitty called Blackwell her true love and requested that her ashes be buried with Elizabeth. And so none of the um, female siblings that Elizabeth had got married. They were all very much focused on their goals. They were very goal driven. Um, and then in 1895, Elizabeth published her autobiography, Pioneer, Pioneer Work in Opening the Medical Profession to Women. In 1907, while holiday, holidaying in Columbus, Scotland, um, Blackwell fell down some stairs and it left her almost completely medically and or mentally and physically disabled. And on May 31st of 1910, she died in her home in Hastings, Sussex, after suffering um, a stroke that paralyzed half her body. So she fell down the stairs. She lived with that for three years, and then she finally passed away. And that is the story of Elizabeth Blackwell. Papa Bear, can you take the box? And we'll get some of your insights and we'll go over fun facts and tidbits. While we're waiting for you to request the box though, we can talk about this week, um, this week's quote. It's, you've got to get up every morning with determination if you're going to go to bed with satisfaction. That was by George Lorimer. Are you here, Papa Bear? Oh, 
Okay. Let me know when you request it because it hasn't been showing up. The requests haven't been. I think it's an app glitch. So just a quick shout out if you're just joining us. Welcome to Person, Place, and Thing, where we discuss a person, a place, and a thing for this week in history. We just talked about Elizabeth Blackwell. She was the first female physician in America and in Britain. Um, and she was a pretty incredible woman. I would definitely recommend looking her up and doing a little bit of um, your own investigation on her because she, there's so much more that she did that I just can't fit into the 15 minutes that I have to talk. So, hi, so I'm, I'm bummed because I'm having problems with my computer, of course, because, you know, that's where it works best to stream from, but so I'm on my phone now. Yeah, I'm like impressed by the amount of stuff you got on her because, you know, I was doing my research and it's like, okay, no, she, she covered that. Oh, she covered that. She covered that. Now, did you, did you talk about with um, when she lost her eye, like the impact that had on her career? I, I've been listening, but I, I'm not sure if you... Yeah. Yeah. So she lost, she wanted to be a surgeon originally. Yep. That's and when she thing. lost her eye, she could no longer be a surgeon. Yeah. And that's the really sad part is, you know, that's one of the, you know, but on the other hand, it's one of those things like when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, we get adversity handed to us. What we do with that is up to us. Yes. So I think, you know, there's so much, like if she'd gone down the path of surgeon, that would have been awesome also. But not being able to go down that path opened up so much other stuff. Yeah. Even her, you know, when I talked about her um, opening her private practice and it was slow to get going, I'm sure because people are like, well, wait a minute. I'm sorry. You're, you're, a, yeah. Wait, you're the nurse, right? No, you're the, you're the doctor. Oh my God. Um, so I'm sure. Yeah. It was different. However, the fact that her uh, private practice was slow to take off allowed her to write a lot of lectures and other papers. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of written stuff from her now because she wasn't able to be as active doing the practical work. Yeah, I agree. I agree, definitely. See, the thing that stood out to me in this whole thing was the way that they voted on her to be accepted to that medical school. That was a joke. Like that was supposed to be a joke. And yeah. every single one of those men voted, yes, she should come. And that to me is like irony you know what's meant to be will be yeah the the yeah, the organization was like let's let's set this up so she's she's sure to fail yes 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 she can't get any no votes what the heck she got all yes <laughs> who whose idea was this let me talk to you. <laughs> come here yeah no it's bless those guys for for standing up for her though too yeah, definitely. So I want to go over some fun facts and tidbits um, with you. Did you know that the average doctor has 40,000 hours of training? Let's see. If you work a full-time job, that's about 2,100 hours a year. So that'd be like 20 years worth of training. Wow. That's like 20 years of training full-time, like 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there are about 1,062,205 doctors in the United States. And 65% of those doctors are male. That is probably about where I, that, that I'm trying to think of what, you know, my first thought was, does that surprise me or does that make sense? And it kind of makes sense. I mean, it's it's not 50-50, but I'm thinking of the last several times I've been to the doctor. Mm -hmm. my, my experience has been younger female doctors, more than younger male doctors, 
but a lot more older male doctors than older female doctors. So it's yeah. it's like a bubble that's shifting. I think it'll continue to go that route until it's more. Well, even. there there are currently more female pediatricians than male pediatricians. That makes sense to me. And ex experts predict that by 2030, the United States will have 122,000 mm -hmm. unfilled jobs for doctors. That also makes sense to me. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, mm -hmm. it's tough now differently than for, I mean, she had a, a really tough road to hoe uh, being, you know, a woman at that time wanting to become a doctor. Nowadays, mm -hmm. everybody, anybody who's entering the medical field has a really st steep hill because a the schedule is exhausting i can't even picture doing that i mean i've There's raised 40 thousand hours of just training uh, yeah and even if you throw in i mean even if it was just yeah so there's a lot of so much effort just to get to be able to say yes i'm a doctor and yes. get your license it's a lot yeah and then definitely it costs so much I mean, that many hours of training is going to be expensive. So a lot of them are going into it with huge debt. So it's kind of like, hmm, do I want to spend 20,000 hours training so that I can work for 20 years to pay off my student loans? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know that I could make that decision. I don't think I'd want to be a doctor because I, I... I do well with my blood, not so much everybody else's. Yeah, I yeah, I, I couldn't be a doctor. Just yeah, it's like one of those. Oh, you're gonna give me an injection? Okay, go ahead. Let me know when you're done. Oh, it's not gonna so, hurt. No. Yeah. Elizabeth was actually squeamish. Mm -hmm. Like the sight of blood made her sick for a long time when she started her medical profession it it was and that was like an uphill battle for her too just to get over her own body's reaction to other people's life fluid. yeah no that makes sense well and was that before or after she had the eye incident it was know. before she was squeamish as a kid oh okay because that would i mean it would make sense if she was squeamish i'm sorry i'm sitting here trying to find a better way to put my phone so that it's <laughs> more eye to eye, but we'll just do this for now. When I come back to the next section, I will, uh, I'll be upstairs with my tripod and everything, so. Okay, all right. Well, you can go ahead and jump out of the box because we're getting ready to jump into our next story. Thank you, Papa Bear, I appreciate you so much. Everybody make sure that you got Papa Bear favorited. He's awesome. He does a lot of really cool things on his stream. Um, so our place is actually going to be Greensboro, North Carolina, right? Does anybody know what happened in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960? I'm going to tell you. There was a sit-in in a restaurant by four African-American college students. And it was organized. Um, but these four African-American college students really kicked off a lot of change for our African-American community here. So it was a sit-in and it was a civil rights protest. Um, and so they were denied service when they came in and they refused to leave. They weren't able to be arrested because they weren't damaging anything. They weren't hurting anything. They weren't they were just sitting there, so they couldn't arrest them. Um, and these four students are called the Greensboro Four. Um, there were four young black men who staged the first sit-in. Um, Ezell Blair, David Richmond, Franklin McCain, and Joseph McNeil. And they were all students from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College. And they were influenced by the nonviolent protest techniques um, that were practiced by Gandhi and as well as the freedom rides that were organized by the Congress for Racial Equality or CORE in 1947. Um, and it was an interracial activist group that rode um, across the South and bus 
in buses to test a recent Supreme Court decision um, that was banning segregation on interstate bus travel. Uh, the Greensboro Four had been spurred also by um, a brutal incident where a young black boy, Emmett Till, lost his life. Um, he was murdered in 1955. And um, it, because he allegedly had whistled at a white woman in, Missi in a Mississippi store. And so he was, um, he was murdered because of that. So when the sit-ins began, Blair, Richmond, McCain, and McNeil planned their protest carefully. They worked really closely with each other. Um, and then they enlisted the help of a local white businessman, Ralph jo jo Johns, um, to put their plan into action. On February 1st, 1960, the four students sat down at the lunch counter at Woolsworth in downtown Greensboro, where the official policy was to refuse service to anybody that doesn't have white skin. Um, and when they sat down, they knew this. So when they were denied service, they refused to give up their seat. They just sat there. And like I said, the police arrived on scene and they were not able to arrest them because of the lack of provocation is what they cited. And um, by the time that John's, um, by that time, the local businessman, Johns, had already alerted the local media. Um, and so they arrived in full force, guys. Like, they, they were in on this action. Um, and it was televised. So the Greensboro Four stayed until the store closed and then returned the next day with more students to sit in. By February 5th, around 300 students had joined the protest at Woolsworth, paralyzing the local counter and local businesses. So they had so many kids come in to set in, in this set in, that it put a damper on the place that they were setting and the surrounding businesses and good for them. Um, and it was and heavily televised. This was, this was hot off the press. Um, and it sparked sit-in movements that spread through colleges and towns throughout the South and into the North. Um, as young and white Black people joined in the sit-ins um, in various forms of people, people protest, peaceful protest against the segregation that was going on um, in liberties, libraries, beaches, hotels, and other establishments. So they weren't just doing this in little cafes. They were sitting in all over the place to try to bring some justice and to take away the segregation. And again, good for them. It takes, it takes a lot of courage to stand up for what you believe in, especially when it's such a huge um, publicized thing. Like these people's faces were on the front of the news day in and day out. And that requires that requires some serious, um, some guts is what that requires. Some of the first sit-ins during the civil rights movement were organized by the history teacher, Clara Lopper and the NAACP Youth Council for Oklahoma City in 1958. By the end of March 60, the movement has spread to 55 cities in 13 states. Um, though many were arrested for trespassing, disorderly conduct, or disturbing the peace, national media coverage of the sit-ins brought increased attention to the civil rights movements. So this really helped spur the civil rights movements because it was being shown on the news what was happening. People couldn't say, oh, that's not happening because it was right there in front of them. It was happening. And in response to the success of the sit-in movements, um, dining faci facilities across the South were being integrated by the summer of 1960. So less than a year, these four young men were able to, <laughs> were able to lift that, um, that integration ban, not by themselves, but they got it started. So, um, at the end of 1960, 
in at the end of the school uh, year in 1960, so at the end of July, um, a, a lot of the local students were on break for the summer, right? And so um, Woolsworth quietly integrated its lunch counters um, and they hired four black employees, Geneva Tilsdale, Susie Morrison, Anitha Jones, and Charles Best were the first to be served. Um, the SNCC, to capitalize on the momentum of the sit-in movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee, SNCC, was founded in Riley, North Carolina in April of 1960. Guys, 1960 was, what, 50 years ago? That's not that long. That's really not that long ago. Um, so this is still pretty recent. Like this stuff was still going on pretty, pretty recently. Um, and the N SNCC served as one of the leading, leading forces in the civil rights movement, organizing freedom rides through the South in 1961 and the historic March on Washington in 1963, at which time Martin Luther King Jr. gave his seminal, I have a dream speech. Got it? Like, it, they got big. Um, and then they worked alongside the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People to push passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and that's called the NAACP. And it would later mount an, organize, an organized resistance to the Vietnam War. Um, its members faced increased violence, however, um, and they became more militant. And by the late 1960, it was advocating um, the black power philosophy of uh, Stokely Carmichael. And that was the chairman um, from 1966 to 1967 and his successor, successor H. Rapp Brown. By the early 1970s, SNCC had lost much of its mainstream support and was effectively disbanded. So it started for a righteous cause and then it went downhill because it was no longer a righteous cause. People had tainted it and it disbanded. So the impact of the sit-in in Greensboro, it was a critical turning point in black history and American history, bringing the fight for civil rights um, to the national stage. So it was front and center, it was being seen, it was being witnessed and we were making change. Its use of nonviolence inspired the Freedom Riders and others to take up the cause of integration in the South, furthering the cause of equal rights in the United States. So that was kind of quick, but oh, there's a there's a little bit more. I got my fun facts. So um, thank you for joining us on Person, Place, and Thing, where we discuss a person, a place, and a thing. Um, we just got done talking about Elizabeth Blackwell. She was the first female physician in the United States. And then we just got our, that was our person and our place it was Greensboro, North Carolina, where the first sit-in um, for integration in our black communities to integrate um, was held. So Papa Bear, if you wanna get back in the box. Oh, there you are, already waiting. What I had a feeling. Wow. Um, what's interesting, I, when I was doing my research, uh, the Smithsonian did an article. I'm not sure when it was, but um, there's a couple things in the article that really struck me. One was when they're sitting at the counter and the police officer came in, apparently he paced behind the students, you know, billy club in hand. And they're all thinking like, oh my God, this is it. But they didn't do anything. They were just sitting there. And eventually he had to give up because it's like, uh, they're not, uh, no, you know, what am I going to do? Okay, I'll leave. And then apparently the last person to approach them was an elderly lady who, an elderly white lady who came, got up from her seat and walked over towards the one who was in um, ROTC. And she told them that she was disappointed in them. And rather than respond like, what do you mean? He just, you know, stay calm. And was like, why are you disappointed in us 
for being asked to be served like everyone else. And she said, I'm disappointed it took you so long to do this. Which is a double edged sort of thing, because on one hand, it's like, you know, she's, she's saying, congratulations for finally doing it. But it's also kind of like, well, ma'am, you had every opportunity to stand up for them also before then. Yes. And, you know, for me, a, a nice response might have been like, I'm sorry it took so long. You know, I'm disappointed that it took you so long to do so. I'm even more disappointed in myself for not speaking up earlier. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. But I think in, in that time frame, in that time period, her saying that was pretty big. A lot. It was a lot. And so to ask her to also be like, as aware to be able to say, and I, as a you know white person, should have said something earlier too. You know, especially being an older white woman, but the fact that she stood up and she you know encouraged their action was pretty amazing. It was a big deal back then. It was a really big deal back then. Um, I mean. History is dark. I mean, that it just is what it is. And there have been many, many, many people slaughtered for trying to stand up um, for other people, for minorities, so many people. Um, so I can understand kind of the, the desire to kind of keep it on a DL, but also I, power comes in numbers, right? So the more people stand up, the more powerful you're going to be. And it only takes one person for more people to stand up. Well, so, that's, yep. One of my favorite quotes is every great move. And I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase it. Every great movement in history has been started by the actions of one person. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. built on another and another and another, but it, it, there's always one first person. And for anything that goes on, I mean, there are issues in my life that, and I'm not going to go into them now because it's not relevant to the show, that I've been an advocate for and an activist for because being a white male, I'm not the typical person who'd experience it in most people's minds. So it makes, it's more powerful when I speak up. Um, but yeah, it, it really just takes somebody speaking up. So um, the fun facts for i'm going to include fun facts for black history month all month um in every show i'm going to be doing some black history fun facts and tidbits um, and i thought that this was a good place for these fun facts to set um so rebecca lee crumpler in 18 she was born in 1831 and she died in 1895 she was the first black woman in the united states to qualify as a doctor opening her own medical clinic in boston and dedicating herself to treating women and children who lived in poverty um, she treated her patients regardless of their ability to pay and oftentimes took no money for her work she just treated these people and then um, a teenager named Cla Claudette Colvin got arrested in 1955 for refusing to give up her bus seat for a white woman. Some local civil rights leaders saw the event as a chance to highlight the city's unfair bus policies, but decided that Colvin was too young to represent the struggle. Still, Colvin's act inspired Rosa Parks to do the same thing nine months later and Park's arrest sparked one of the biggest civil rights campaigns of all time. So that was a teenager. A teenager was the first person to sit on the bus and refuse to give up their seat. Well, you know how those teenagers are. <laughs> Rebellious little suckers. <laughs> and you know, and there's some, there's some greatness to that. It really is. There really is. Definitely. I thought that was really cool because I've heard of Rosa Parks. We've all heard of Rosa Parks, you know, but I didn't know that it was at a result of a kid doing it. You know what I mean? Like that yeah, blew that, my mind. Like a kid? Me. Yeah, that was new to me. Definitely. Yeah. And then um, the current population of Black and African Americans is 46.9 million. Um, the U U.S. Census Bureau reports also 89.4% of African Americans age 25 and older had a high school diploma or higher in 2020. And that came from Fox 10 in Phoenix. 
So 89.4% have at least their high school diploma. That's pretty good. That's really good. Yeah, I, and because I don't even know what the, you may have just said it and I was spacing out for a second because I was reading stuff about, I'm getting ready for Groundhog Day too as we're talking and looking over stuff. <laughs> now, did you talk about the, the average for the nation as a whole of those who have finished their degrees? No. No, I didn't. This was just a fun fact that I put in uh, for Black History Month. Cool. And then um, 50 years after the first celebrations, President Gerald R. Ford officially recognized Black History Month at the country's 1976 bicentennial. Ford called on Americans to seize the opportunity to, off to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of ende endeavor throughout our history. Okay. And the 2023 theme for Black History Month is resistance. Past themes have included black health and wellness, family mitigation, and black women in American culture and history, among others. I didn't even know that it was themed every year but it is. Yeah, I, I, I think it's one of those where I kind of realized that, but not like, if you would have asked me, I probably would have said, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> well, going back to, yeah, the average in 2021, the national graduation rate was 85.3%. And, uh, 79% of black students, 81% of Hispanic, and 89% of Caucasian students. Oh, say graduate on time. I didn't look deep into this one, so I'm not sure if this is like how many people. Yeah, this is this is just between 20 ages 25 and up. Yeah. So who knows when you factor in how many people go back and get their GED, which yeah. I would consider a graduation. I do. I, yeah. I consider any your, kind of you have your high school degree you graduated. Yep. Yeah. So that's all that I've got for um, Greensboro, North Carolina, and our next topic is Groundhog's Day. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> so this year. The groundhog did see his shadow, so I hope you all got bundled up and ready for six more weeks of um, winter. So that's fun. Okay, so our thing is the groundhog because of Groundhog's Day. That was on the 2nd of February, in case you guys didn't know. Um, and it, it falls uh, midway between winter, winter solstice and the spring equinox. Um, February 2nd is a significant day in several ancient and modern traditions. Um, the Celts, for instance, celebrated it as embolic, a pagan festival, um, marking the beginning of spring. So it goes way, 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 way back to freaking Vikings. That's a long time ago. And um, as Christianity spread through Europe, embolic involved into candle mass. Um, a feast commemorating the presentation of Jesus at the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. In certain parts of Europe, Christians believed that a sunny can candle mass meant 40 more days of cold and snow. Germans developed their own take on the legend, um, pronouncing the day sunny only if badgers and other small animals glimpse their own shadows. Um, when German, when Germans immigrate, Im immigrants, um, settled in Pennsylvania in the 18th and 19th century, they brought on the custom with them, um, and they chose the native groundhog as the an annual for forecaster. Um, so it went from just little critters to strictly the groundhog, um, as, as their, uh, mascot to decide who or to decide the weather um so the first groundhog day celebration in i can't even say this punk shitoini was the brainchild of local newspaper editor climber frias who sold a group of businessmen and groundhog hunters 
<laughs> I agree. I like ground. I like Bill Murray and Groundhog's Day. Um, and this was known collectively as the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club on the idea. Um, so the men trekked to a site called Gobbler's Knob, where the inaugural groundhog became the bearer of bad news when he saw his shadow. Um, nowadays, the yearly festival in Punxsutawney um, are presented over by a band of local dignitaries known as the Inner Circle. Its members wear top hats and conduct official <laughs> official proceedings in Pennsylvania Dutch dialect. They supposedly <laughs> they supposedly talk to the groundhog in groundhoggies. And everywhere every February 2nd, tens of thousands of spectators attend Groundhog Day events um, in Punxsutawney a borough that's home to some 6,000 people. It was immortalized in the 1993 film Groundhog Day, which was actually shot in Woodstock, Illinois. Um, so let's talk about how accurate the groundhog is, shall we? Any guesses? <laughs> While well, sunny days, are indeed associated with colder, drier air. We probably shouldn't trade in our meteorologists just yet um, for our groundhog. Um, studies show that our dear groundhog has only been correct 50% of the time. So he's only right half of the time. Um, Staten Island Chuck, on the other hand, is reportedly accurate almost 80% of the time. So if you're going to listen to a groundhog, make sure that you go to Staten Island because he's apparently more intelligent than the other one. <laughs> Kinda. So um, for the last 30 years, residents of Vermilion, Ohio have turned to a, quite a different creature to predict their weather forecast. Um, the woolly bear caterpillar. According to tradition, if the bugs have more orange than black coloring in autumn, the upcoming winter will be mild. So it doesn't so much tell you when winter will end, it's just gonna help you predict how the winter will go. And if it's got more orange on it, this is a caterpillar. If it's got more orange on the caterpillar, you're gonna have a mild winter. So pay attention to those caterpillars if you're in Ohio. And more than 100,000 people attend the town's Woolly Bear Festival, held every fall since 1972. <laughs> but the Woolly Bear caterpillars aren't the best prog prognosticators either um, because their bands vary from year to year and it's actually goes off of last year's winter is what decides what their bands are going to be, not the coming up winter. Um, and we don't need to predict past winters just yet. <laughs> um, so groundhogs, also known as woodchucks, belong to a group of large ground squirrels known as marmots. They grow up to 25 inches long and can live for 10 years in um, captivity. According to the legend, um, Punxsutawney Phil is more than 125 years old. But thanks to Magical Punch, he, Im he, Im he imbibes every uh, summer. Groundhogs spend the winter hibernating in their burrows, significantly reducing their metabolic rate and body temperature. And by February, they can lose as much as half of their body weight, um, just sleeping. When they're out and about, the bristly rodents, they eat succulent plants, wild berries, and insects, and they really don't mind helping themselves to people's gardens either. Um, so they can be quite a nuisance. 
And that is the story of the groundhog. I know that it was super short. The thing usually is super short, but that's just because you can only talk about a groundhog for so long. <laughs> and, and that's how it started. It started way back in the Viking days. Um, so if Mr. Um, Papa Bear wants to join the box, we will discuss the groundhog. Way ahead of you. Yeah, no, I, I was looking. I was amazed. I would not looked at this before, and I didn't realize how many different animals. Groundhogs, squirrels, hedgehogs, badgers. Be, I mean, it's like right? any small furry animal potentially going to be able to predict the weather. <laughs> wow, imagine that. Oh, some of the ones, <laughs> what was the one I just saw? Um, yeah, so badgers is one. Bears, apparently. Mm -hmm. were thought mm -hmm. to emerge on February 2nd. And if bear shots, uh, this goes back to the Europeans, um, which, you know, it caught my eye, bear, hey. Mm -hmm. uh, and, oh, Punxsutawney. Punxsutawney, there we go. Listen. <laughs> I, saw you start, I, I, I should request a box now just to pop in and be like, by the way, it's Punxsutawney. Okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, yeah I, I never would have, like, it, some of these names are hard to say. The only reason I know Punxsutawney is because I watch Groundhog Day. And they say it in the movie several times. I haven't seen it for a long time. And years so and it years. just struck me. Um, apparently moles are also a, yeah. a prognosticator. Prognosticator. You got that one. I was actually proud of you for that one. Prognosticator <laughs> is a tough word. <laughs> Well, Bulls, it's, it's squirrels, frogs, foxes, cows, crows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So uh, when he's not predicting the weather, uh, Phil lives in the town library in what, how'd you call it? Punxsutawney? In Punxsutawney with his groundhog wife, Phyllis. Of course. And he has only predicted an early spring 16 times. Hmm. <laughs> and he's only been right. Actually, the, the study I saw has him actually at 40% accurate. Well, what I read yeah. said 50. Yeah, 40, 50. Either way, it's like he's got about as much. I could go out on February 2nd, flip a coin, and have as much of a chance. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when I had heard so once upon is... a time, and I, I can't find it anywhere, but that it was backwards, that people were saying, if he saw a shadow, it meant six more weeks of winter. But if he didn't see it, it was actually even a longer winter. Somewhere I, I read it that. it was six or four. I thought if he seen his shadow, it was six weeks. If he didn't see, it was four. Yeah, and, and I've not seen the I've not seen anywhere where if he doesn't see it, I only see like if he sees a shadow, it means six more weeks. And somewhere I heard that or read it that that was actually a good thing. Because you think about it, if it's sunny on February second, it's a nice day. It would kind of make sense mm -hmm. that winter would be shorter. And I saw another quote somewhere it's like, Yeah, no matter what, it's gonna be six weeks because spring starts when spring starts, so February, tomorrow, yeah, so it's seven weeks later that spring officially starts. <laughs> yeah. So this one, this was a fact that I, I really actually ended up laughing a lot at. In 2010, Texas started its own tradition and uses its state mammal, an armadillo, to predict the weather for Armadillo Day. <laughs> The armadillo named B. Cave Bob makes his weather prediction at the West Pole in B. Cave, Texas. Good to know. If I go to Texas, <laughs> I'll know where to go. <laughs> go see the armadillos. Yeah. Oh, and some, that was I mean, funny. some of the yeah, some of the other ones make more sense. Like squirrels are more a predictor of it's gonna be a harsh winter, supposedly, because mm -hmm. if they have a bushier tail that means they're feeding up more uh to prepare what about yeah. like bears because they stay in a cave yeah same fight. idea you know bear comes out 
but even that one's talking about if it sees his shadow, then it's six more weeks. What's up with the shadow? <laughs> I don't know. You know, again, I would think that um, if it's bright and sunny on the second, that would actually make it seem like it's going to be a shorter winter. Right? I agree. I agree. But apparently that's not how it works. Yeah. Welcome to Person, Place, and Thing, if you're just joining us, um, where we talk about a person, a place, and a thing for this week in history. We've talked about Elizabeth Blackwell, who was the first female physician in the United States. We talked about Greensboro, North Carolina, where the first sit-ins um, for uh, Black rights and civil rights was conducted. And then we just got done talking about the groundhog uh, for Groundhog's Day. And I have some honorable mentions for you. What I do is I just go through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and tell you different things that have happened that I thought about covering, but maybe couldn't find the information or it might have been a little bit too um, confrontational. Does that, is that the right word? Uh, provocative. Provocative, yeah. So, um, Honorable mentions. Monday, February 6th of 1952, King George of England died, and upon his death, his daughter, Princess Elizabeth, became Queen Elizabeth II, um, Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Her actual coronation took place on June 2nd of 1953, though. And then Tuesday, February 7th of 1940, the second full-length animated Walt Disney film Pinocchio was premiered. Wednesday, February 1st of 1878, Haiti Caraway was born. She was the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate. Um, she was born in Bakersville, Tennessee. Her husband became the U.S. Senator um, from Arkansas following his death in 1931. She filled the remaining of his term and then was elected herself. Um, and she served a total of 14 years. And then February 2nd, 1869, James Oliver invented removable tempered steel plow blades. I don't know what it's like where you're at, but here we still have two feet of snow on the ground. Same thing. I could not, I could imagine not having plows to remove all that from the road. Could you imagine out there with your little shovel plowing the road to get to the store? No. Probably just jump in your horse and buggy. <laughs> uh, February 3rd, 1943. Oh, I like this one. I don't like this one, but I like this one. An extraordinary act of heroism occurred in the icy waters off Greenland after the U.S. Army transport ship uh, Dorchester was hit by a German torpedo and began to sink rapidly. When it became apparent there was not enough life jackets, four U.S. Army chaplains on board removed theirs and they handed them to the frightened young soldiers and chose to go down with the ship while praying. So they gave up their life for their younger, what do you call them, comrades? Yeah, I thought that was really cool. I mean, like not cool that they had to die, but really cool that they were willing to um, sacrifice themselves so that their younger friends can survive. And then yeah. February 4th is National Thank a Mail Carrier Day. Wait, February, what is National Mail Carrier Day? It's not February 4th is National Thank a Mail Carrier Day. I missed it. Dang it. It was three days ago. No <laughs> wonder I haven't been getting mail for the last couple of days. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> They're mad at you. Didn't tell them thank you. And then, no, uh, they like me because I always, I always uh, shovel by my, by my mail. And actually, we have four mailboxes at the end of my drive for the neighbors mm -hmm. around. I always make sure that the path is clear to the mailbox because they don't have to deliver if they can't reach your mailbox. No, he, yeah, that's true. Um, my house that burnt down, there was like a community mailbox, you know, the one where it got yeah. like a whole bunch Everybody of different boxes in there. It was in my front yard. 
So that was not my responsibility to keep it clear. And people would have their dogs come and poo all over there. And I just couldn't imagine being a mail carrier trying to deliver mail and fight with dog poo. So I made sure to keep that clean too. It was, I, there's a reason that I'm not a mail carrier. <laughs> they get a lot of crap. Um, but thank you so much for being my guest, Papa Bear. I You're appreciate welcome. you so much. Everybody hit Papa Bear with a favorite. He's pretty awesome. Um, go see his stream. He's very talented. Um, he's a very talented musician. And I think that you guys would all really enjoy his music. And thank you thank for you. joining us on Person, Place, and Thing, um, where we talked about a person, a place, and a thing for this week in history. We are out of time now. And um, I've got a lot that I've got to get done. So I'm going to go ahead and end here. Um, next week, same place, same time. I'm Bye, Papa Bear. Thank you for coming. Um, same week, same time. Uh, we'll be doing three more topics. If you guys have any, um, see you later. If you guys have any suggestions on what to do next week, I'm always open to listen. And oh, yeah. So top three gifters. I was going to let them pick the topic for next week, but I had a really hard time getting a hold of the last ones to give me a topic. So if you can give me a topic, these three up here, Chef Bob, Asia Kim, and Casey, if you can do it by tomorrow, I'll do that topic for next week so something significant for next week chef bob you've got person asia kim you've got place and casey you've got a thing so if you guys want to give me ideas or a topic to research and then talk about next week i would love to hear it and thank you all for coming i really did have a fun time researching all of these topics um it was crazy because i've had a really crazy busy week but i think we did all right and with that I will bid you all adieu. Bye.